In this video, we would like to calculate the density of polonium knowing only its atomic weight and the unit cell dimension. Polonium crystallizes in the simple cubic structure. So as we recall, a cube has general shape as such. And it only has one unique dimension, which we represent with the letter A, because the height, width, and length are identical, it being a cube. In the case of polonium, this particular dimension is 335.2 picometers. Now, from this information and knowing that the atomic weight of polonium is 209 grams per mole, we are going to use that information to calculate the density of polonium. As we recall, our formula for density, our definition, is mass divided by volume. Density is an interesting property because mass is an extensive property. The mass of a particular object depends on how much is there. The volume is also an extensive property. The more material we have, the greater volume that it takes up. But if we take the ratio of mass to volume, the density, we get an intensive property. So this intensive property does not depend on how much material we have. Therefore, when we calculate the density, we're going to use the most convenient mass and volumes that we can because it will not matter. The mass and volume that we select to use for our calculation will be the mass and the volume of one unit cell. In both cases, it would be one unit cell worth 205. So our density calculation will revolve around two separate steps. One will be to calculate the mass of the unit cell, and the second step will be to calculate the volume of one unit cell. let's calculate the volume of the unit cell first. We realize from geometry that the volume of a cube is simply the edge length cubed. Now this particular edge length A has a length of 335.2 picometers. Now a picometer by definition is 10 to the minus 12 meters. Now the meter turns out to not be a particularly useful unit in this calculation. So we're going to transform it in two steps. The first step is to turn this expression more completely into one in scientific notation where we have exactly one non-zero digit to the left of the decimal point. So we can show a way to do that. And we can rewrite 335.2 in the following way. So we can write it as 3.352 times 10 to the second power. So that is just the 335.2 rewritten in a useful way. The second part, we are going to just continue with our times 10 to the minus 12. And our units are still meters for the time being. Next, we recognize that I can use the associative property and regroup this expression in the following useful way. three back there. 
and group the, just the powers of 10. And I notice that when I group the powers of 10, the 10 to the second power times 10 to the minus 12 is going to equal 10 to the minus 10 power. So we use the properties of exponents here. to write our number more completely in scientific notation. When we multiply powers of 10, we, and they have the same base, we add the exponents. The next step is we want to convert from the units of meters to the units of centimeters. So we recall that one centimeter, by definition, is 10 to the minus two meters. The centi means 10 to the minus 2. So if we multiply this particular expression, we notice that the units of meters will cancel. And we can, again, use the properties of exponents. Then when I divide powers of 10, I subtract the exponents. So that's going to give me 3.352 times, now we have 10 to the minus 10 divided by 10 to the minus 2, and now in the units of centimeters. To solve for this particular expression here, 10 to the minus 10 divided by 10 to the minus 2, we recall that when we divide powers of 10, we subtract the exponents. So the new exponent is going to be minus 10 minus a minus 2. Minus a minus is equivalent to addition, so that's equivalent to minus 10 plus 2. So our new expression is going to be 3.352 times 10 to the minus 8 centimeters. So now we have successfully converted from the units of picometers to meters to centimeters. Converting to centimeters will assist us in our computation of the volume of the unit cell. Now that we have converted the edge length A into the useful units of centimeters for this particular calculation, we can calculate the volume of one unit cell. So we recall that we had converted to 3.352 times 10 to the minus 8 centimeters. And in our formula, to compute the volume, we need to cube that edge length. So we raise this to the third power. If we perform this particular computation, we see that the overall volume is going to be 37.6627 times 10 to the minus 24. And then our units, because our units are centimeters, we have to cube the centimeters as well. So we end up getting a volume unit of cubic centimeters. It was entirely to get this unit of cubic centimeters that we perform the series of unit conversions converting picometers to meters and then finally on to centimeters. So at least now we have the volume of one unit cell. Next we want to compute the mass of one unit cell. So to do that we realize the following that we have the atomic weight of polonium which is 209 grams of polonium in one mole of polonium. We also know that one mole of any substance consists of 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd particles. So we are going to use that fact here. So one mole of polonium consists of 6 0.022 times 10 to the 23rd atoms of polonium. So, since 
the numerator and denominator are equal in this particular case, this fraction acts like the number one. When we multiply by the number one, we don't change any expression. We might change what it looks like, but we don't change its overall value. So therefore, we are, can use this particular fraction to convert. Now, one other feature we need to add in here is that in a unit cell, we're looking at the mass of a unit cell, there is exactly one atom of polonium in a unit cell of polonium because polonium is a simple cubic structure. So now we can do our unit conversions and we notice that we can cancel moles of polonium with moles of polonium, atoms of polonium with atoms of polonium, and we are left with the units of grams of polonium. So this will give us the mass of exactly one unit cell. And that particular mass turns out to be 34 point seven zero six one times ten to the minus twenty three grams. The minus twenty three comes in because we have ten to the twenty third power in the denominator. So when we divide, remember we subtract exponents. So we get the ten to the minus twenty three grams. And this is the mass of exactly one unit cell of polonium. Having now computed the volume of one unit cell of polonium and having computed the mass of one unit cell of polonium, we can combine those two facts to calculate the density. So remember that density equals mass divided by volume. The mass of the unit cell, of one unit cell, was 34.7061 times 10 to the minus 23 grams. And the volume of one unit cell is 37.6627 times 10 to the minus 24 cubic centimeters. Now, whenever we have a problem like this that involves both ordinary numbers and powers of 10, we can always break it up into two problems. And I like to do this. I always like to break up the non-powers of 10 part from the powers of 10. So we can break this up into 34.7061 divided by 37.6627. So that's one part times 10 to the minus 23 grams divided by 10 to the minus 24 cubic centimeters. And the reason that we're allowed to do this is that multiplication is both associative and commutative for ordinary numbers, so we're able to do that. If we continue, we can solve for just the numerical part here, and we see that this gives us a value of 0 0.9215. And then we can do the computation with the powers of 10. Recall that when we divide powers of 10, we subtract the exponents. So to get the new exponent for the power of 10, that is going to be minus 23 minus a minus 24, which we convert to minus 23 plus 24, which means 10 to the first power grams per cubic centimeter. One last step, we recall that 10 to the first power is just 10. So this is 0.9215 times 10, or 9.215 grams per cubic centimeter. And we have successfully calculated the density of polonium using information from the unit cell. Well, we still have one step that we have to do. And this is a step we need to perform no matter what calculations we ever are working on. And that is a reasonableness test. One of the reasons for converting the lengths from picometers to meters to centimeters is specifically so that I could get my final density units in grams per cubic centimeter. I recall that the density of water is almost exactly one gram per cubic centimeter. 
So that is a useful value that we should commit to memory because it comes up quite a bit. And then we recall that the range of densities of metals on planet Earth, for the alkali metals are very slightly less than one. The densest of the metals, osmium and meridium, are slightly above 22 grams per cubic centimeter. Therefore, if I get a number that's very, very, very much less than one gram per cubic centimeter, or I get a number that's very, very much more than 22 grams per cubic centimeter, I know that I have a value that's wrong. So that reminds me that I need to go back in my calculation and check to see where I might have made an error. The fact that our final value turns out to be 9.215 grams per cubic centimeter means that we have a quite reasonable value for the density of a metal on planet Earth.